Hello, and welcome to another Story Explained video. In this one, we'll be looking into the story of Outlast 2, another terrifying outing from developer Red Barrels. This game took the fast-paced parkour-style mechanics of the first Outlast to another level, and although not as terrifying, 2 was definitely a game which left me terrified. However, it also left me wanting more. Now, whilst there isn't a direct story correlation to Outlast 1, there are plenty of links, being that they're set in the same universe, if you will. Anyway, we'll do our best to unpack this very disturbing story. Now, I need to warn you that there are story elements and subject matter in this video, which some of you may find disturbing, so obviously, viewer caution is advised. The story begins with a chopper flying over an Arizona mountain range. In this chopper, two freelance reporters, husband and wife Blake and Lynn Langerman. After Blake wakes from a nightmare of a young girl calling out his name and crying for help, he mentions that he was dreaming about an old school friend of theirs, Jessica Gray, whom they haven't thought of or spoken of for years. They decide to move the conversation on by discussing the reason that they are there, and that is to investigate the discovery of a young pregnant girl found by the side of the road and then committed suicide in hospital who is only known at this point as Jane Doe. They attempt to film an intro, but this is cut short by a loud noise and a blinding light which literally knocks the chopper out of the air, crash landing in the wilderness below. Blake wakes up in a school, a Catholic school called St. Sybil to be specific. Following a very tall man, Blake reaches a couple of doors, turns around, sees a young blonde girl and then a large wave of blood coming towards him. He eventually comes to after being thrown from the chopper before it landed and makes his way down to the wreckage, but there's no sign of Lynn. The fact that Blake was thrown from the chopper turns out to be a blessing in disguise because the pilot has been captured, skinned and nailed to a cross. Blake, whilst in shock, makes his way down the path and sees a church in the distance. He makes his way into a village and whilst the villagers seem to be visibly armed, they are not hostile. But that doesn't last long as Blake comes across a lanky mess called Marta who tries to attack him. Blake encounters the same flash of light that downed their chopper. He hears a man preaching and makes mention of Lynn. Blake sees Lynn making escape out of a window and goes after her. After hearing Noth speaking over the loudspeaker, saying that he discovered that Lynn is pregnant and Blake is the father, the yoke mate, Blake questions her on the pregnancy. Lynn states that she has no idea what they're talking about. Lynn goes on to complain of stomach pains, but they continue on down the path. They don't get far, however, as they're cornered by what we refer to as the cultists. While the cultists are capturing Blake and Lynn, another group turn up and kill the cultists. Are these saviors? Hardly, these people are called the Heretics, led by the very mysterious Val, and Blake and Lynn have seemingly stumbled upon an all-out civil war between the two sides. We'll discuss them further later on, but let's get back to the plot for now. Blake is hit over the head and is now seeing double. He stumbles down another path and is discovered by a man named Ethan. Ethan tells Blake that he is considered an unborn, as he was excommunicated by the cult for denying his daughter Anna Lee to a man named Papa Noth, as Noth intended to rape her and impregnate her and kill the child inside her. Blake realises fast that Anna Lee is the Jane Doe they were there to report on. Ethan mentions he helped his daughter escape, and after Blake mentions knowing who Anna Lee is, Ethan asks if his daughter is okay. Knowing she is dead, Blake lies so not to break Ethan's heart and tells him she is fine. Ethan gives Blake refuge in his cellar. Blake sleeps and dreams of Jessica, but is awakened by crashing and raised voices above him. It's Marta. She is beating Ethan, demanding to know where Blake is. Ethan lies and is killed for his trouble. After thanking Ethan for saving him and telling him he hopes he's find his daughter, Blake leaves, but seems to be mentally unraveling. I mean, who wouldn't? Blake comes across the church he saw from the village earlier. He comes across a man called Josiah, strapped to a wheel, and he's had his eyes gouged out and it has the word Judas carved into his chest. This man begs Blake to kill him, as the cultists will be bringing his wife Mary to the church for torture in order to coerce Josiah to reveal the location of Lynn. Noth and his cultist goons arrive and torture Mary. Josiah gives in and tells them that the heretics took Lynn to their hideout in the mines. Blake uses this information, makes his way to the mines, and goes through the area of the mountains inhabited by a group of people called the Scald. Again, we'll explain them more in depth a bit later. Blake crosses a bridge, but is attacked by a swarm of locusts and falls down to the ground below. After coming to again, Blake is making his way through the Scald, and happens upon a small deformed man called Laird along with his mount Nick. Laird captures Blake and calls him the Scald Messiah. He grabs Blake's video camera and states that a modern messiah indeed wouldn't use a book, he'd use a camera. Blake manages to get free and runs after Laird, in order to get his camera back, as it's the only documented evidence he has for what's happened there. After getting the camera back, Blake is again captured, and this time is buried alive. After escaping once again, Blake is traversing down a rope when Laird and Nick try to pull Blake up to capture them again, but Laird and Nick were pushed off the edge by the Scald, killing them. 
Blake continues on and ends up at a lake in which he needs to cross by raft. When he's doing this, a huge wave engulfs him and he is thrown from the raft. He ends up at the mines eventually where it appears to be raining blood. Blake is hounded and harassed by Val's heretics, but makes it to the lower depths of the mines where he hears Lynn struggling with the heretics. Blake gets captured by Val, but has a brief respite when a cave-in occurs in the mines, allowing him to briefly escape. I say briefly, as Blake doesn't get far before he runs into the heretics again, who drug him. He spots Lynn, who is tied up and involved in some kind of, let's just say it's a ritual. Val then appears to sexually assault Blake. During this, Blake passes out and has another vision. He's with Jessica, and she appears to be trying to kiss him, but he doesn't want to. They leave the kitchen and go to class, but they are cornered by a priest called Father Lautermilch. Lautermilch accuses them of wrongdoing. Blake states that they weren't doing anything, and Lautermilch tells Blake to go home. Jessica pleads with him not to. Blake is walking away when he hears a scream and sees Lautermilch chasing after Jessica. He stumbles across Jessica with a broken neck, revealing that she didn't hang herself, but she was in fact killed by the priest. He made it look like a suicide to avoid being caught, and warned Blake to keep quiet. Blake comes to, yet again, and sees that the cultists have attacked the heretics on the back of what Josiah told them earlier. He reaches Lynn, who bizarrely seems to be pregnant and ready to give birth. Although Blake is confused, he says that he will keep Lynn and the child safe. Lynn mentions to Blake that it's his baby, but he mentions that they haven't had sex in months, so he doesn't see how that's possible. The sun appears to be massive, and it looks likely to engulf the entire world. They reach the church in the midst of a massive storm, and Lynn gives birth to a baby. Well. Actually, no, she doesn't. Judging by the shadow, she doesn't give birth to anything. Lynn states that there's nothing there, then dies, leaving Blake holding a baby that isn't real. It's only a delusion. Noth turns up and states that Blake needs to crush the skull of the child under his foot. He mentions that God seems to be ignoring him now, and he's confused, as he feels he had perfect faith in being able to kill all of his followers. Noth slits his own throat. After going outside, Blake sees the town lifted with dead bodies. The cause of death? Cyanide poisoning. A mass suicide ordered by Noth. Blake drops to the ground and the glowing sun seemingly destroys him and the entire town. Blake has a final vision which shows Jessica calling his name and that she says she will never let him go as he will do the same for her. The game finishes by Jessica saying a prayer. We got a lot to unpack here, so what better place to start than discussing the many groups of people we see in the game. First, let's discuss Papanov's devoted following of morons in Temple Gate, a testament of the new Ezekiel, or more specifically, Noth himself. Sullivan Noth referred to himself as the modern Ezekiel. If you aren't familiar with the Bible, Ezekiel was a captive taken to Babylon who became a prophet of God, who saw a vision of God and four creatures. So a bit of background on Noth. In 1966, you know, before starting a cult, Noth worked as a shoe salesman in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was having financial difficulties and was about to lose his home due to incurring large unpayable debts. It's written that Noth turned to an evangelical radio station in his desperation, but instead found himself disagreeing with the sermon regarding the sin of extramarital sex and fornication. He claimed to hear a message hidden in the static, in his mind, a message to him from God. It states that Noth heard the message say that God was unhappy with the churches in the world and that he needed a brave new prophet to carry his message. On the back of this, Noth started to preach on the streets and out in public. He became very influential with people choosing to follow him and donate large sums of money and possessions. The cult lived on a ranch owned by a rich lady called Lydia Deegan. It was at this point that Noth recorded the messages he was getting from God in a book called The Gospel of Noth. Sullivan Noth became more and more fanatical by the day, now encouraging the women of the cult to breed regularly and even getting involved himself, if you know what I mean. Noth also took it on himself to deliver every child. But this gave birth, excuse the pun, to trouble for Noth. Due to the home births, the police were given permission to raid the ranch due to safety concerns. Many followers were arrested after dead bodies were found on the estate, but Noth managed to escape with a bunch of his remaining followers. With all the church possessions seized, the church had lost everything. Drawing on inspiration from Moses and Abraham in the Bible, Noth climbed a mountain to have a little conflab with the boss, whilst naked, as you do, and felt that God told him to slit open his eyeball. He did so, and saw a vision of his future church. Town deep in the wilderness, I think you can see where this is going now, he would call this town Temple Gate, and the purpose of this town was for his followers to wait there for the end times. The cult settled here in 1971. It's referenced in the Gospel of Noth chapter 1 verse 1 that the only problem was that indigenous tribes happened to live there, so naturally they did what any murderous cult would do and they forcefully took the land for themselves. Noth hears a couple of messages which are the catalyst for the cult being the messed up state that it is. The Antichrist would be born out of his own flock, Killing children is okay, incest is okay, providing the mother of the child is dead, and Noth can sleep with whomever he wishes. Whilst we only see Noth twice during the course of the game, the game's narrative is drenched in his gospel. Blake stumbles across followers of Noth who are constantly reciting scriptures and singing songs out of pure devotion. 
Over the years, Noth's cult would become more and more deranged and fanatical, in the end, going completely insane. We'll dive into the reason for this insanity a little bit later on. They frequently killed their own children due to being completely devoted to Noth's vision and purpose of preventing the Antichrist from being born out of their flock. They were viciously protective of their town and their purpose, and this is shown through Marta, a kind of enforcer for the cult, whom all the other cult members were scared of. Quickly moving on to Marta, it appears from the game that Noth knew Marta when she was growing up, and he potentially groomed her. She felt guilty for killing people, but Noth told her that even though it was sin in the eyes of God, it was basically needed to be done to protect God's plan. The cult, however, was unravelling. Ethan was the first sign of the cult falling apart, and that some members were losing faith in Noth. This is shown at the end when every single member commits suicide via poisoning, when Noth informs them that they failed to prevent the birth of the Antichrist. Led by the unmistakable Val, the heretics came about when Val, then a member of the cult, started being consumed with lustful dreams of killing. We find this in a note in Val's journal where Val feels the dreams are a message, but the message is nothing holy. Val arranged to meet with other cultists who had similar dreams to them. These meetings caused the cult of Noth to be split in two. The members, after living in and around the mines for so long, had gone so insane to the point of now being like animals, covering themselves in mud and sticks, moving like marsupials, and their language appeared to be broken English. Their main goal was the polar opposite to Noth's. They wanted the Antichrist to be birthed. This was all born out of Val's desire for chaos and destruction, and Val ultimately felt that the birth would bring out exactly that. The heretics and the cult, being that they have such differing views, are embroiled in an all-out civil war. This all comes to a head when Blake awakens from a dream after being assaulted by Val. The heretics have been killed by the cult, but the heretics have ultimately succeeded in their mission. In their minds, at least, the Antichrist has been birthed. Now, with all that unprotected sex with every woman in the village, sexual diseases such as gonorrhea and syphilis spread like wildfire. This leads us to the Scald. The village became afflicted by these diseases and anyone who became infected was sent off an outcast to live in the mountains. The Scald, by its definition, means covered in lesions, bumps and sores. North would tell his deacon Laird that the reason for this affliction was the result of their sins. Laird became afflicted by disease himself and was cast out by North but retained his devotion, even keeping in regular contact with Noth. You recall from the story that Laird and his Mount Nick were pushed off the edge by the Scald because there was rising mutiny within the ranks of the Scald, and they weren't happy with how they were being led. So, if the Scald are sick with gonorrhea and syphilis, what about Noth? Well, we learn that Noth is suffering from these afflictions too, but he sent some of his apostles out to the towns and cities to obtain penicillin for him to be able to keep his sickness in check. He kept it for himself, of course, because, well, it's Noth. He lied to his followers and said it's a study aid instead. Now, the disturbing part is this. The school believed that they would crucify the school messiah, who they believed was Blake after finding his camera, then bury him and then eat his flesh. They believed this would cure them of their affliction and they could go back and live amongst the cult members once again. As the cult members and the heretics are all dead at the end, the school would still be alive, I guess, but with nothing left to live for. It's probable that it just roamed the forest until they died. Okay, so confession time. I actually found the school section more disturbing, scary and unsettling than the village. It's straight up creepy. But this section is actually crucial as it gives us backstory into Blake. The reason I found it more disturbing? The mysterious demon. You know, the one that is basically just a mass of limbs and a huge tongue. We get the hint throughout the game that something terrible happened to Jessica. At first it seems like it was a suicide. We even find that suicide note from Jessica. But at the end of the game, after many visions, the big reveal. Father Lautermilch tried to sexually assault Jessica as Blake was leaving, so she ran off, being chased by Lautermilch. Blake opens the door to find Jessica there with a broken neck, and Lautermilch standing at the top of the stairs. This echoes an earlier vision where we saw the demon standing at the top of the stairs. It's heavily implied that this demon is Lautermilch, and represents Blake's own view of Lautermilch, that he is an evil demon roaming the school. This is confirmed when you see the demon has the same facial birthmark as Lautermilch. It's clear now that Lautermilch threatened Blake to keep quiet, an act which has clearly haunted Blake throughout his childhood, so much so that he still has dreams about Jessica, like we see at the start during the chopper scene. So, it's implied in the game that the baby wasn't real, as there was no shadow cast showing Blake to be holding absolutely nothing. But Blake sees a baby, Noth sees a baby, and the cult and the heretics believe there to be a baby, but how? Here's how. Now, those of you that played Outlast 1 will remember the Murkoff Corporation who facilitated the shocking events at Mount Massive Asylum in Outlast 1. Well, believe it or not, although not glaringly obvious, they are involved, heavily involved. 
Recall the bright flash of light and the noise which disoriented the villagers? Murkoff. Let me explain. In Outlast 1, we found a document from a lady named Jennifer Rowland, which stated that after conducting her 14th autopsy on a variant, she became tired of her work, tired of Dr. Wernicke, and requested a transfer. A transfer to where? Well, we find a document by the lake in Outlast 2, which states that a Jenny Rowland is here. And what is more telling is that this document describes the towers which we see in the background and the subjects, who are the citizens of Temple Gate. It mentions that the signal remains strong even after a severe storm. The note seems to be written by someone not involved in the cult, not one of the heretics or the scald. It seems to be written by a researcher working with Jenny Rowland, therefore another Murkoff employee. Remember, Murkoff was shut down on the back of their MK Ultra mind control experiments, so what better place to go and practice their research than in the wilderness of Arizona? Alright, 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 so this document actually pieces everything together, as this document describes a mysterious feedback loop. The author of this note mentions that this loop somehow makes the signal stronger the closer they got to the site. It's clear that this site is Temple Gate, where the cult was located, but areas such as the top level of the mines were also affected, as were the mountains where the school lived. Now, it seems that short-term exposure to the signals that the tower gave off were okay, but in the long term, frequent exposure to these signals would result in hallucinations and visions dependent on the subject's own psyche. Sounds kind of familiar to the morphogenic engine, doesn't it? In Blake's case, he didn't really seem affected by the second flash of light when approaching the chapel, as he hadn't experienced many of these signals yet. But the more he experienced, the more vivid his visions became. He held on to a lot of guilt regarding walking away from Jessica when Lautermilch told him to leave. He felt responsible in some way for her death. This is also why the cultists became more and more devoted and deranged, even willing to kill their own children for the cause, because they were manipulated to do so. They were all test subjects to the Murkoff Corporation. Now, this also explains to us why Lynn was still relatively sane when Blake found her. She escaped Noth's cult early on, but after being caught, was taken deep into the mine straight away. It's highly likely that the signals couldn't reach all the way down there. Everyone except for Lynn had been heavily subjected to the signals from Murkoff Towers, which explains why she didn't see a baby. Blake, due to his deteriorating mental state, and as a result being very suggestible, genuinely believed that Lynn was pregnant, so his mind made it believe that there was a baby. As did Noth, this explains why Noth also saw a baby in Blake's arms. It needs to be mentioned as well that Blake starts referring to the cultists as adults. His mental age has seemingly regressed back to his child state. Blake also becomes so delusional at the end that he has all but replaced Lynn in his thoughts with Jessica and speaks of keeping Jessica safe. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Lynn appeared pregnant and gave birth. Well, we found a document in Outlast 1 claiming that exposure to the morphogenic engine could cause phantom pregnancies in women. Phantom pregnancies are a condition in which nausea and abdominal swelling are present in a woman who is not actually pregnant. It's possible that Lynn was caught somewhere between the two extremes. The signal being relayed by the tower at the start caused Lynn to have a phantom pregnancy, but she was not exposed to the signals enough for her to actually go insane. We're now going to take a journey and have a quick look at the Murkoff account, a series of comic books which help explain what happened prior to and after the events in Templegate. Let me introduce you all to Paul Marion and Pauline Glick. They work for Murkoff's litigation department. Or rather, they just help clean up Murkoff's mess, silencing problems of Murkoff. But normally this just meant making veiled threats, which Pauline mentions in issue two of the Murkoff account. These two were looking for Whalen Park, you know, from Whistleblower, and encountered Simon Peacock. And just in case you don't remember, Peacock is the man who was standing over Whalen at the end of Whistleblower. Peacock escaped but went back and slipped a note into Paul's mailbox with coordinates on it, with the message, your daughter is connected. Paul went to those coordinates, but he encountered a bright white light, the signal towers. Paul then started to hallucinate and see a vision of his dead wife in the hospital where she died. We also learn that Paul's daughter, Alice, is also sick and needs a blood transfusion. He comes to and is attacked by what appears to be a cultist from Temple Gate with a young pregnant girl. Paul kills the cultist after a struggle, but the girl has run off. Family find Paul bleeding out and take him to the hospital. But it appears that the girl has also been taken to the hospital. They don't know the girl's name, so they just call her Jane Doe. Paul makes mention of the psychosomatic pregnancies we discussed earlier. However, the baby is healthy and is real. The doctor mentions anomalies in the girl's brain scans, and Pauline Glick mentions similarities in brain lesions due to scarring from the morphogenic engine. It's implied here that the morphogenic engine is being used via the signal towers at Temple Gate. Paul and Pauline go to see the girl, and they notice a tattoo on her chest. It's a symbol from the book of Ezekiel in the Bible. The girl starts to have a seizure, and Pauline tells Paul to get a doctor. 
But Pauline kills the girl and the child, knowing that this is the work of Murkoff, like I said, clearing up their mess. Paul goes home for Alice's blood transfusion, but she isn't there, and a message is scrawled on the wall which states, you work for us now, along with Alice's finger on the ground. Meanwhile, Pauline goes to clean up the dead body in the desert that Paul left earlier, but doesn't find anything. It's revealed to us that Marta recovered the body. Now this leads us to the epilogue. Noth is seen administering poison to one of his cultists and he enters the church, playing out this scene with Blake. While this scene is happening, a colony of ants which have been possessed by the wall rider, yep, the wall rider, begin to attack the Murkoff radio tower. It's likely that this action caused the towers to break down and emit a signal stronger than ever, causing the storm, then the bright flash which Blake sees at the end of the game. But in the real world, time passes. Seven hours later, Pauline arrives at the site. She states that she believes Simon Peacock has been giving Paul information about Temple Gate. We see Lynn, and Pauline mentions that Lynn was at the hospital asking questions about Jane Doe a few days earlier. She mentions that it was Paul's job to make sure that Lynn and Blake didn't find Temple Gate. They find Blake, but he's completely catatonic. They send him to a facility for experimentation. Given that Blake is now Murkoff's test subject means that he's likely dead. Or maybe he'll feature in the Outlast trials in some way. We just don't know. But anyway, that pretty much wraps up the story of Outlast 2. I hope this did a good job of explaining what happened, why it happened, and what it all means. If you enjoyed this story explanation video, don't forget to leave a like on it and comment down below your theories on what you think happened. Subscribe to support the channel, but for now, take care and I'll see you in the next one.